Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you. That's very nice. I'm used to standing. I want to be. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is it weird that I was like, we sold out Google? <laughs> what if no one was here? This would have been so heartbreaking for me if no one was here. So thank you for being here. There was a guy who had Sonic the Hedgehog as his wallpaper, so I already feel comfortable and at home. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I don't have a Pixel phone. Neither do you. You're fired. Oh, it's a Pixel. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. That's the Google phone. It's a wonderful. I don't know. It's great. It's wonderful. You guys probably work on it, right? I shouldn't make fun of it. It's a, probably a great phone. How's this going so far? <laughs> anyway, thanks for having me, seriously. And thank you for, for wearing leather pants. For you, anytime. Thank you very much. You're ready to fall off a motorbike. Um, so this is. How's this going? I think it's great so far. I'm I just going to let you have a mic, and I'm going to leave. Now, no, don't leave. Don't leave you. Yes, you read the book. I did read the book. That means a I lot. I did my homework. I also like that you were just like, just buy one. <laughs> Guys, just buy one. <laughs> I'm your best sales rep. Like when there's a I birthday, and you have to go around and collect money because they consider that a gift. Yes. I know what's going on at Google. <laughs> Do you guys know what's going on on Google? That was an inside joke. She said that you don't get uh, cupcakes for each other because you have to buy them yourself. It's true. It's just you guys at YouTube. <laughs> These guys give each other birthday gifts. It's true. How's this going? <laughs> <laughs> you went like this. I would, I would have accepted. <laughs> okay, anyway. I'm enjoying myself. Good, I'm glad. Uh, so, so I've seen a couple of uh, articles where they've said, so are you a comedy sex god? Is that what this book is about? Yeah. It's not. You've made that clear. No, but... most of the sex in the book is with myself. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I kind of think there's like this Venn diagram, right, of like comedy, sex, and God, and then there's like you in the middle of this Venn diagram. But like, yeah. tell everyone a little bit about like, what is the overall relationship that you've discovered between comedy, sex, and God? Well, really, it's, it's, it's sex and God. Comedy has been my through line. That's what I do. I do comedy. And uh, sex and God are, are so closely intertwined. It really doesn't matter if you were grown up, grew up spiritual or not or religious or not. I think everybody knows that sexuality and our bodies in general are a soft spot. It's, it, and, and shame is a great motivator for people that are trying to control other people, whether it be a religion or anybody. Like, because, you know, that's why they wrote everybody poops. You know what I mean? It's, that's to address shame. You're like, what's happening in my butt? You know, like, you need a book to be like, it's normal. And then when it comes to sexual function, unfortunately, uh, in the church that I was raised in, and a lot of people, you were told that that was pure evil. <laughs> so God and sexuality were so closely linked for me because I wasn't like tempted. This is real. I was a sweet boy. I wasn't tempted to steal. I wasn't tempted to lie or cheat or, or be a, can I swear? Sure. Be an asshole. But now you are. Being an asshole? No, no. How dare you? <laughs> But I was, obviously, once I hit puberty, you have this sin, and I, I don't mean that, I'm just saying this is the word that the, the church used. You have a sin baked into your physiology, and that is cognitive and physical dissonance. So, so many people that I know that were raised spiritual ended up leaving their spirituality at, for very understandable reasons because they were at odds with their very being. And we were, we were given a transactional model of love from the universe or from the mystery or from the void or from God or whatever you want to call it. But we thought this thing didn't like what we were for being what we were. So naturally and understandably for that and a multitude of other reasons, people left their faith and I was one of them. I, I left because my wife left me and I was suffering and my model of God didn't match with that protection plan basically. I thought God was supposed to protect me from bad things and then he didn't hold up his end of the bargain. So then I wrote this book. Nobody asked me to write this book. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can always tell when a comedian is just kind of doing a cash-in book. You know what I mean? Where it's like you holding a McDonald's bag and it's like, they forgot the ketchup packets. And it's like a memoir in jokes and farts or whatever. And, <laughs> and you know they were just doing it because they're having a moment and they want to make some money. And there's nothing wrong with that. These are my people. I love them. But I wanted to write a book about the things that I think are valuable for everybody, atheists, agnostics, spiritual people, it doesn't matter. 
the, the philosophies and the techniques and the practices that are valuable, the babies from the bath, basically. Let's get rid of that judgment. Let's get rid of that shame. Let's get rid of that hell. Let's get rid of that you are fucking garbage and you need to be spited. What's the past sense of spite? I don't know, spoten? You need to be <laughs> spoten. And, and let's see, like, why do these stories kick around? Why do they fill such gaps in our collective subconscious? Why do, they, why do they minister to some people and not to others? Well, what are the good parts that we can sort of rescue? And I thought, you know, nobody's ever going to ask me to do that. I'll just do it. I love that. So, uh, you know, one of the things you talk about in the first page of the book is, like, what are we doing here? Yeah. What are we doing here, Pete Holmes? I know. What are we doing here? Isn't that nice? The best thing I can offer us, really, not just more information. You guys are doing great. If you work here, you must be doing great with, <laughs> with your intelligence and your cognition and your, your retention. So the best thing, yeah, your linguistic skills, your aromas. What I'm saying is the best thing that I can offer anybody, and anybody can offer, is just a little bit of presence. And, and this book is not a book of answers. Um, I, I write in the book that trying to understand infinite, infinite, uh, infinity, excuse me, which we all sort of agree we're floating in right now. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> we never think about it. It's overwhelming, so we don't think about it. But you were born flying. You're flying right now. You'll die flying. You're flying and spinning. It's crazy. And none of us know what's going on. I sort of write about that. I say it's like we're dogs trying to understand the internet. I can't explain the internet to my dog. And you can't explain infinite to me. But we can use symbol systems and stories and methods to quiet our minds and experience it, like feel it. There'll never be a God worth worshiping or even calling God that we can house in the four walls of our brain. We want one, the Western model. Man, we want one so bad, I want one. It would be great to have one, the model, the theory, everything and just write it down and have it because then we can do what we've always done with religion is exclude and be like we have it you don't have it we're in you're out we're saved you're gonna burn it's nonsense dogs in the internet that's us and that's okay what i'm saying is the way to spirituality is, is almost more like the way you appreciate a painting there's a chapter in the book where i talk about going to a museum and i realized that i went to a museum to think about art you know what I mean? You ever watch dancers and you're just thinking about dancing? You're like, wow, are they related? You know, like you're just like, how many times did I practice that? You're like, you're, it's, you're missing it. Like, and I see people do this at the Met. You go to the Met, people are going room to room, just going like, okay, I saw that one. You're thinking later. Someone's gonna ask you, well, did you see the, did you see the Monet's? Uh, yeah, I saw them. Like you're living, <laughs> you're living for later. And, the, and the, the art that's gonna move you, it's always in the next room. It's never the one you're looking at. And even the one you're looking at, you're like, it's not that great. Look at the Mona Lisa, so small. I know that's not in the Met. I'm just saying like, you're looking at something, it's kind of stupid, it's just paint. You're right, it's just paint. Can you quiet down a little bit? You could get more out of one painting in the Met if you just sat with it and tried to quiet your analytical, comparative mind, which is beautiful. We are in a monument to the analytical comparative mind. And I am a great benefactor of the analytical comparative mind. It got me here with directions. It vaccinated my baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I am not anti-science at all. What I'm saying is when we try to apply the Greek logic, uh, you know, binary system of, of, of reason to things like God, it's, it's in the same way we're misunderstanding art or sex or poetry or jazz, music, that's, that's the space that I'm trying to say the mystery belongs in. But of course, in the West, we've turned it into, as I already said, it's exclusion. We got it and you don't. And that's what my church was. We got it and they don't. Even other types of Christians, like I'm from Boston, where white people are racist to other types of white people. <laughs> Christians are exclusive to other types of Christians. Same God. But you're, oh, you're doing it wrong. Everybody was out. But when you realize that, like, isn't it weird that your group is always the group that's in? It's the one that you were born into, that your parents told you, that your country embraces? Like, the first step to, like, 
to, for me, for freedom, or you could say enlightenment or whatever, is to realize if I was born in India, I'd be a Hindu. You know what I'm saying? And you have to say, yeah, you're goddamn right I'd be a Hindu. I'd be a Hindu. That's, that shit, I know you guys know this. You guys are way beyond this. I'm just saying this is the sort of message I'm trying to get out there, which is we need to admit that we don't know, but beyond that and just saying, well, it stops there, what can we take with us not to know it and to know that we know it and to brag that we know it, but to experience it, to have some here and now now? Because even some of us, when I was talking about floating on a planet, ooh, the colors in the room just kind of come out a little bit. I'm not talking about getting into heaven later. I'm talking about experiencing the vitality and the juice and the, the, the sex. I don't mean sexual intercourse. I mean the attraction of the, of, of the world, of life that you're a part of, that you were born into with inherent dignity. You're a part of the lawful unfolding of the universe. That's good news. We turned it into, you know, believe this or go to hell. That's terrible, that's shitty news. <laughs> but to, to wake up to your participation in something that's more like an undulating, recycling, infinite fountain, when you wake up to that, that's liberation. And that's fun. And then you can do everything you're doing. I can be a comedian, you can be a programmer, whatever it is. I learned some tips while I was at the urinal. <laughs> yeah, pl play the game. Get get excited about the new Pixel phone. Whatever you're gonna do, just don't get lost in it. And I'm sorry, I know I'm ranting, but it's like, or I'm going on a tear. I don't know what you want to call this, but it's like, why? I don't want you to believe what I believe, but for me, joy and peace only exist in your base consciousness, in your unencumbered awareness. The word that mystics use for this is soul. We don't have to agree that there's a soul, but we can agree that there was something in you when you bo were born, the lights flipped on, and that's your awareness. And then around that awareness, we build what Freud and Jung call the false self. This is the story we tell. I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm American, I'm from Pakistan, whatever it is, that's your story. I like cheese, I don't like cheese, I like the first three Batman movies, whatever it is. That's, that's just all bullshit. That's all just nonsense. It's a fun game to play, but it's not who you really are. Who you really are is what's looking at your eyes right now. Just that. And that is you. Isn't that great? <laughs> and all we're doing is reflecting back to each other, like I look at you and I go, yeah, you're a woman. Hey, woman. <laughs> hey, you, you work at YouTube? And, and we just, Ramdas says we, we reassure everybody that our suits are on correctly, our space suits. <laughs> I'll pretend you are who you think you are if you pretend who I am, who I think I am. But my baby, I just had a baby, she has no story to sell. She's just a baby. This is why we love being around babies. They're not trying to convince you of anything. They don't know that, she doesn't know she's a girl. She doesn't know she's white. She doesn't know she's American. She doesn't have any preferences. Or she does now, she's seven months, so she's building some. <laughs> She's coding them. <laughs> but in, in her early stages, she, was just, she just was. And that's what it is. In the Old Testament, when Moses asked God what his name is, all this new agey nonsense, it's in the Old Testament. He says, I am. So God is saying that God is I am-ness. We can all agree on that. These are just symbol systems. Judaism is just a symbol system. It's a great one. Christianity is just a symbol system, but science is pointing to the same fundamental mysteries. In fact, physics is doing a much better job showing us that we're all one thing than, than religion ever has nowadays, because they have data, and we love that. That's really fun to go like, oh, this is all, the air is made of the same molecules as me and you, and there's no separation, it's all illusion. It's really great stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's emness. But why, why get in touch with your I amness? It's because that's where peace is. You can calm down your anxieties by rationalizing them or problem solving or, you know, going like think big picture or doing some positive thinking technique. It's nonsense. And a fresh batch of anxiety and dread is coming for you. <laughs> so the only way to get around it is to, is to disidentify with, with the story, with the person that's experiencing the story, with the false self, with the small self and to identify with the part of you that's witnessing it. Science would call that your consciousness. And when, you're, when you realize that you are consciousness and that you didn't come into this world, as Alan Watts says, you didn't come into this world, you came out of this world. You didn't like, you're not a visitor, you are, it is like the Matrix, you're like, it's like Mario Brothers. 
you're made of the same pixels as the mushrooms and Luigi. You know, I know you know. This is your world. This is what you guys do is, an, is, is a micro version of what's happening. It's there's a language, there's a code, there's the pixels. That's you. You're a part of this program. And that's where peace is. You can't feel it in your ego, except for five seconds. You eat ice cream on the beach, and you're like, wow, I've really done it. <laughs> and this is Ramdas. Ramdas says you eat the ice cream, then what? You want water. Then you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> then you want lunch. Then you're bored and you watch a movie. Then you're bored, it's, it's 2019, then you watch nine movies. <laughs> then you're tired, you go to bed. Then you wake up and you're groggy. Then you want coffee. Then you gotta go to the bathroom. Then you want breakfast. Then you want the train to go faster. It's endless. There's no peace to be found here. The peace that Jesus and Buddha and Krishna and everybody's pointing you to has nothing to do with being nice, has nothing to do with being moral or a decent guy or well-liked or successful or a capitalist. Fuck, the, no, no, none of that. It's about realize, all of mysticism is realize who you really are. I don't care what you believe. Like I said, atheist, agnostic, it doesn't matter if you, if you like signposts. Do you want signposts? We got religion. You don't want one? Fine. Get there however you get there. That's what it is. Realize who you really are. Realize your inherent worthiness and value and, and placeness in this. And that's where peace is. Let's talk about comedy. Wow. <laughs> I told you I'm a talker. I know, I was so happy. You would have made a good youth minister. That's absolutely, That's what my mom I wanted. Know. Um, so uh, you, you, you tell some of the same stories. I've seen a lot of your content, whether it's been through crashing or in the book or even in your stand-up, for example, you talk about how you proposed to your wife in a hot air balloon. Yeah. What was it like writing these stories versus telling them in a stand-up routine or telling them through Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, and I've Thank never you. been asked that question. I feel bad. Yeah. Thank you. In-house talent. She did some stand-up too. I don't know if she told you that. Happening after the show. It's okay, the yeah, show. we're gonna do a show. I'm gonna open for you. <laughs> it's be My wonderful. dream. <laughs> um, you know, it is. It's weird when even when I talk about this stuff, it's a little bit different than it is in a book. I like talking because you can feel that feedback. You know, even when you guys are being quiet, when you laugh, when you pull back. I, I swear, there's like a frequency people, or maybe it's a pheromone, or it's probably a sound or facial expressions or something I'm putting together based on like, oh, I'm losing them, you know? So that's when you go like, how am I doing? So you're trying to, you know, find, there's a give and a take in a live talk, which I benefit, that's, that's my favorite medium. So when I was writing, say, a story like the hot air balloon story, which I told in my stand-up special, you can't just write it the way you said it because you can see how I communicate. I like faces, I like just sounds and all that sort of silliness. So you can't just write like, imagine, <laughs> imagine a guy who sort of looks like Zach Braff if he let himself go. <laughs> and he's making a weird face. Like it doesn't work. So you have to figure out, you have to look at other authors that you like, like David Sedaris or whatever, and be like, how do they create a, a music? Because a book is like stand-up, but it's up to the, reader to do the timing, you know what I mean? You can't control how they read it. So sometimes it's the, the architecture of the page, like you'll, you'll do an unnecessary paragraph break just to slow them down, or you'll do a page break just to slow them down, or in a perfect world, like the big punchline's on the next page. Like that, those are ways that you can kind of use the, the formatting of the book to prevent someone from reading it wrong. Because I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I'll be reading a paragraph and I'll think I'll have a guess on where it's going and I'll kind of scan it for the words, like they're talking about Bill Clinton. So I'll look for Bill Clinton and lo and behold at the end it's like, and that man was Bill Clinton. And I'm like, ha, I knew it. And then I go back and read it. So you're looking for ways to sort of like control their experience. Which again, I have to imagine was what a, a lot of you guys are in the business of doing is like imagining someone you couldn't possibly know, how are they going to interact with what it is that you're making to control or hopefully optimize their experience. There's a similar thing going on in storytelling. That's probably why it feels natural to do what you're doing. Even though we have no like, you know, historic context for what you're doing, it is, a, you're, you're telling stories, you know, you're telling some sort of story. That's interesting. Uh, so a lot of the book is obviously about the relationship between sex and the church. 
What do you think the church, how do you think we, the, the church should be reforming how they're teaching kids about sex? Yeah, I, you know, it's a little bit divisive, I suppose, but I, there's, it's, it's, in, it's in the ballpark of, of child abuse, I think, to tell somebody that they're going to hell. Because kids believe you. You sort of forget that. Do you remember what it was like being a kid and the world is just legs? There's just giants everywhere that can reach things and, and seem to know things. They tell you not to swallow your gum and they tell you not to eat like the peppers at the bottom of your Chinese food and they know everything. And, and I remember when you believed anything anybody would tell you, like being gullible as a kid is such a huge thing. Kids would trick other kids. Remember, sometimes we'd tell a joke that had no punchline and then would all laugh just to get another kid to laugh and then be like, why was that funny? And like. <laughs> That's what it's like to be a kid. Like, why, if you can tell them that we're floating on a planet, why are they stupid for believing that in Arizona there's still dinosaurs? You know what I mean? Like, why is that less preposterous? But kids are gullible and we're trying to make sense, so we're looking to the legs, we're looking to the grown ups. And then a lot of grown ups, you know, obviously acting out a lot of their damage and a lot of their psychology, which I have compassion for and empathy for. But that leads to a fear based transactional relationship with God. We've made a God that is like us instead of the other way around. And again, when I use God, I just mean this. I mean everything. And when I look at the world, I don't see judgment and fear. I see flow. I see grace. I, I see a dance. I see play. And you know what else I see? I see m thousands of types of flowers. But it's so funny. We just try to make every, like if I'm a daisy, I just go around trying to make everybody a daisy. But what I see are innumerable flowers, each of them loved indiscriminately by light and by rain from above that grow and are cherished and are equal parts of this world. So I see a God or a mystery or this that loves diversity. And yet we are afraid and we're small and we're clinging to our meaning and we're damaged by our wounds. So we go around projecting a God that is also doing that, that's also angry, that's also xenophobic, that's homophobic, that's sex phobic, that's everything phobic, Every, all of us, it's us, we've made us. Big us in the sky with the beard, and he hates who we hate. He never hates us, he hates who we hate. And that's how you can really smell that you're full of shit, is if your God hates what you hate, yeah, <laughs> fuck yourself. <laughs> Look at the world. That's what Jesus is doing. I, I, that's how I was raised. That's why I know so much Jesus stuff. But Jesus, all his disciples are like, we're being occupied by Rome. Look at all this. And he's like, Jesus is always like, look at the flowers. He's always going, look at the flowers. Look at the birds. Look at that tree. He keeps pointing people to nature because that is the flow that we're a part of. And then our stories and our egos and all the stuff that we've sort of lost control over has built this false world, this Maya and that's where so much of this pain and suffering and, and exclusion comes from. So I would reform it by stopping all of that. <laughs> so for, for people who find that their uh, religious or political beliefs change from that of how they were raised, sometimes that causes strain with their families. Do you have any advice for people who sort of end up going in a different direction or on a different path? Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things that Jesus says that no one ever quotes is that he, he says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. <laughs> Everybody thinks he's this board game loving, <laughs> booze turning down Republican. And he's not, he's not. He's an anti-capitalist hippie that loved <laughs> prostitutes and homeless people. And he said straight up, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. I didn't come, I came to turn brother against brother. This is one of those verses that nobody quotes. And what does he mean by that? He means when you start to wake up, other egos aren't gonna like it. If you start saying your game is, is play, your game is just an illusion, it's fine to play it, but it's not the real, other egos get very mad at that. And yeah, you're gonna lose friends. Christ's journey, whether it's literal or not, it really is not important to me, it's modeling how energy moves in the universe. You want change, you get death first, then you get crucifixion. This is why this story is, it's, look to the first Iron Man film if you want a secular version of this. <laughs> you wanna change, an ego, if you've ever seen one, Tony Stark, he has to die in a cave, in a cave. I know you guys, you're smart people. I'm just saying the cave is inside. 
The heart turns to light. He builds a suit. He uses his intellect to beat his intellect, and he creates a new heart. Are you fucking kidding me? It's right in front of our faces. It's everywhere. And then he emerges, and he's reborn. That's how energy moves in the world. You want change, you have to die. You want change, you're going to lose some friends. You want change, you're going to have some awkward Thanksgivings. It's okay. But here's the great thing is, like, it's how it goes. I, I'm really obsessed right now with like movies like Green Book where a guy, a racist guy, goes on a road trip with a black guy and then he becomes not racist, right? This is common. We see this all the time. A pastor will have a son and the son is gay. Suddenly the, son, the dad, the pastor, is scouring the scriptures for verses that are pro-gay. It's hard to find pro except the Old Testament. So he starts building a different theology, right? He's been converted. Why? Because he loves his son. So this guy falls in love with, a, with his the black guy, and, they, and he becomes not a racist. The, the pastor has a son that's gay, and he's not uh, homophobic anymore. This is what happens. You, you go on a road trip with a trans person, and I'll make it even better. The trans person saves your life, right? Suddenly, you're not trans. If, if you were transphobic at the beginning, you go on this trip. You have a three months with them. You share stories. You break bread. They save your life. Now you're like, I get it. You're converted. But here's the thing. You have to have the conversion experience without, you have to have the conversion, excuse me, without the conversion experience. We don't have time for everyone to go on 375 road trips. <laughs> you need to go into the place inside of you, not where you think about love, not where you rationalize love, where you are love, where you are yes. The same yes that's holding my molecules together, that's keeping everything on the planet, that made gravity, I'm not saying a conscious man that made gravity, I'm saying that is gravity. Find that place in you that is I love and shower and shine light on all the flowers. Find that in you, it's quiet, but it's there. And then you can be converted without a fucking road trip. And that's what, when you said that, I was thinking about the parents, they're all a road trip away from understanding. So we have to have compassion on people. If somebody's in the third grade, we don't go like, those idiots, because you're in the fifth grade. You just go like, yeah, I was in the third grade too. Like, I don't eat meat. I don't go around shaming people that eat meat. That's ridiculous. I ate meat for 36 years. You know what I'm saying? And I could have been hit by a bus that day, and then I just would have been a meat eater. What? <laughs> so then I changed, but like, who cares? Like, I can't go around, like, it's when people stop smoking, and like, the week they stop smoking, they start telling smoking, you know, it kills you. It's like, you, I'm you. And that's when you realize that it's all one thing, that's when you start having compassion. You can just go like, oh, that's, that's the universe being this or that or this or that. But it's all just, eventually we're all going to take our masks off and we'll be backstage. Mm. You understand? I don't mean you, your ego is going to be in heaven. That's, that's silly, you know, that idea. Literally, like, I'm not going to be like, I'm Pete, I'm in heaven, I did it. <laughs> I knew my book would get me in. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somehow that I do not understand. I believe at some point we're all going to have a good laugh. <laughs> Whether that's literal or not, I don't know. A lot of the book and even crashing came from sort of this place of challenges. And I know that one of the themes is, you know, getting something out of these challenges. Some of those challenges were a divorce with your wife that then led, led you to sort of lose faith in, in the church. Yeah. Um, so are you grateful for these things that have happened? Have they, they've obviously given you a unique point of view. Yeah. Again, going back to the bus thing, like, so I did, my wife did leave me and I lost my faith. And then, yeah, I got a, a that helped me make a TV show that helped me write a book. So that's normally what people mean when they say everything happens for a reason. And usually my stomach turns when people say that. I hate when people say that. Um, and they usually mean stories like mine. Look to Pete Holmes. His wife left him, but then he turned it into HBO. Right? <laughs> it's nonsense. I could have been hit by a bus the day after my wife left me. Then what? Then what was the reason? I died sad and divorced. Where's your, where's your reason? You know what I mean? When what I explore in the book is the idea that things are happening lawfully, let's say, fountain, undulating fountain, just in the way the ocean waves are coming in lawfully, they're obeying a certain set of rules. So we're undulating in the fountain. And they're happening, and they're not happening for a reason that applies to your story, to your, to your false or small self. 
That's stupid. That's just American go get them. Boots that's just bootstraps thinking. Like, you know, I got hit by a car, but then I lost my job. But then I got that new job, and that's where I met Helen, you know, and <laughs> and that's what we mean. And that's when we go, do you believe in God now? It's like that's nonsense. That's wish fulfillment. You know what I mean? That's the lottery, that's the slot machine God who we believe in him when he pays out. Right? Bullshit. That's that's giving God the same transactional if then bullshit love that we don't want from him. So we, or her or it, we do it to that. It's stupid, it's going both ways, it's ridiculous. But when you kind of wake up or start to embody what I believe is going on is that suffering, and it's hard, I do not recommend saying this to people who are suffering, but in my experience, suffering can have a sandpaper quality to your consciousness, not to you, your story, that, as Buddha would say, all that stuff is on fire. The cup's already broken. Your life's already over. All the stuff that you're acquiring and your specialness and my book and my TV, it's all gone. Zoom out, it's gone, it's gone, it's fine, it's gone. What really matters is the quality and spaciousness of your consciousness. I don't believe that you're gonna be on your deathbed and go, remember the food at Google? <laughs> I might. <laughs> I don't think those are the things that are going to give us comfort in those moments. I really don't. I think a lot of us are living like we'll be like, remember that? That was pretty fun. I think what we want to cultivate, and this is Taoism, if you find your way in the morning, you can gladly go in the evening. It's the idea of cultivating a spaciousness to your consciousness and an identification with who you really are so that you can detach from what dies and what, what continues. Again, I don't think your ego continues. I'm saying what play you're a part of. So suffering, in my experience, can be the, as Ramdas says, the grist for the mill or the sandpaper that kind of polishes you. Because when I'm suffering, I'm clinging less to my life. I don't even, I don't even want it. So it's this way of saying like, okay, who is it that doesn't want this? Who's watching the suffering? Who's hearing the thoughts? Who's, who, who is it that's like, I'm hungry. Like, who's noticing the hunger and then reporting it to your brain? Like, that's you. And the suffering is to sort of help us lighten up or enlighten up and realize our true identity. As I already said, that's, that's mysticism. You're not who you think you are. That's what everybody is saying. That's what everybody's pointing to. Let's talk about comedy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's talk about diarrhea and dicks. I mean, <laughs> I keep getting so deep. <laughs> <laughs> Got to bring, bring you back out. Um, so th in the book, you actually talk a lot about um, a whole scene that you've been a part of and, you know, with, with Mulaney and Kumail and people who have been your, your friends who you've worked with on your podcast, on your show. How like, you've really sort of thrived off of this network. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Does that exist today? Yeah. Sometimes people would call bullshit on crashing because they were like, well, I'm a comedian and that's not my experience. And maybe, you, I, I bet you can relate. I think anybody in any profession can relate that they're like, people don't help people. You know what I mean? Uh, and my show, the TV show is all about comedians and the book tells these stories of Mulaney or Kumail, we're all helping each other. And whenever a comedian would be like, that's, my friends don't help me. I'd go get new friends. <laughs> <laughs> like you're with the wrong circle. We'd call it comedy cancer. I know that, you know, it's not funny to talk about cancer. What I'm saying is it would kill you. It, it's going to take you down. Everybody that I know that was a hater or always comparing what other people got and what they should have got and who sucks even though they got this and that and the other, they all stopped. It choked them out. They couldn't do it. And I found people like Mulaney and Kumail and uh, a lot, too many to count, that were in the same sort of frequency as me. Um, there was competition, obviously. Uh, I write about a moment in the book where I get a talk show and, and John Mulaney said, true jealousy. <laughs> and I was like, that's the only compliment a comedian can really give is to admit that you're jealous. So there was that going on, but we were, we were kind about it. And especially if you're trying to do something creative or, or, or I don't know, like an outlying sort of thing. You need some allies, even if it is a lone wolf thing like doing stand-up. Yeah. Microdosing and shrooms. So there's Who's microdosing? <laughs> the first thing I said when I got here, I was like, who's microdosing? No one's microdosing. Who's microdosing? I'm not a narc. I know I look like a narc. I'm not a narc. 
Um, you, you don't have to tell me on camera. <laughs> I microdosed LSD recently for the first time, and I, I told you, I was like, it felt like I had meditated for an hour, took half a Xanax and a shot of espresso. And it was, I don't know if you've done any of those things, but imagine three of them together, it was pretty wonderful. And psychedelics are a, a part of my um, story, is that here I am talking about the mystery and the void and, and the infinite and all this stuff. That's really different if you've had uh, a mystical experience, for lack of a better term, and one of, the, one of the easiest ways, you can, I don't know, you could fast for 40 days or live in a cave or something, but uh, you can also just buy some mushrooms from a roadie at Bonnaroo. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what I did. And I, I was not intending, I was intending to enjoy MGMT. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on meeting God again. <laughs> but that's, that's what my favorite, uh, one of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, he says, you don't come to God by doing it right. You come to God by doing it wrong. Or you could take that word wrong out. You just come, come by doing it. Whatever, whatever it is, including eating drugs at the music festival in Tennessee. <laughs> and, and what was really ex important about that experience, whether or not you ever do psychedelics, was it was very helpful to me to have something that was transrational, not irrational, but actually beyond rationality. There were no terms, there were no rulers I could measure it with, there was no language I could, it was ineffable. I couldn't talk about it. And that's what sort of opened my heart to the idea I wasn't ready to accept it, but the idea that maybe that's what authors of holy books were doing was they were using myth and metaphor to talk about dogs and the internet, to tell dogs about the internet. Because once I came down from my trip, I was like, it's, it's gone. It, 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 it had evaporated like a crazy dream, but it, it had changed my, my body. I still remembered it in my body. And I did my best. I wrote a chapter called Mushrooms, and I did, I did my, it, when I read it, it makes me feel like I've microdosed, so I think I did a good job. But it's very, very hard to talk about. And that's why I was like, if we can't even explain a, a psychological phenomenon like hallucination, um, what chance do we have to, to explain the, f you could call it the singularity or, or God, you, the, the infinite point speck of mass that erupted into everything here, including your juice bar and your massage parlor. <laughs> Well, my favorite line, actually, is when you say it was like Kermit meeting Jim Henson. Yeah, Kermit turning his head and seeing Jim Henson. <laughs> I'm going to open it up to questions. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I hope God is Jim Henson. My God. That would be awesome. So feel free to, to join us at the microphones. I'm going to ask one last question first. Sure. Which is, uh, I've read somewhere that this is like, this is like season four of Crashing. So for fans of Crashing, I don't know how you feel about that description. I don't know what we would yeah. have seen Pete do. Like, would we have seen Pete reach spiritual enlightenment in season four? But what's the relationship? I mean, we were talking about doing a Mushroom episode and an episode where I got a talk show. So I think it is accurate that if you liked Crashing, that this is sort of the fourth and fifth season. Because we always mapped it out that I would eventually meet my wife, and that's covered in the book, and, and that I would eventually find some sort of equanimity, and that's in the book. So yeah, I, I think that's an accurate description. Cool. All right, let's start over here. Oh. Hi. Hi. First, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess I have a question geared more towards like the process of making a switch. Uh -huh. You know, you mentioned like this is what it was, and this is what it is now, and so I guess that idea of the space in between, right? Most people don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I've, now I completely think of something else. Right. And I think you touched on it a little bit by talking about, you know, your families, the awkward Thanksgivings. Um, <laughs> but, right, so I, I came from, like, a very similar background in the Deep South. I've lost everything, including the accent. Um, <laughs> and so I, I guess I would just love to hear your thought on that transformation of, like, how it changes. Yeah, I, it's, I think it's wonderful, because I've been writing this book for three years, so even while I was doing it, the transformation was happening. I think it's really important to note, too, that there were times when I was editing it, and I didn't even agree with myself. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it's, it's not a flaw in the system that we're not always there, for lack of a better term. That place where we all feel it, sometimes you have it at a concert, or having sex, or whatever it might be, you just feel that bliss, you feel that okayness, that big O okayness. 
And I would have to edit a book about that when I when I was hangry or grumpy or on a deadline. Or I, last time I was in New York doing press, I had to go back to the hotel exhausted and edit the book. And I'm reading about this asshole talking about like everything's okay, and I was like, "Fuck you!" Like I didn't agree. So that is even in the course of a day, there's the the remembering and the forgetting. But that is like the sine wave of existence to me. It's, it's not a flaw, the give and the take, the remembering and the forgetting is sort of what gives all of this its charge. That being said, to really, I hope, answer your question, the reason I mentioned three years is because it's been longer than that and it's been these, like, talk about microdosing. it's been like these micro adjustments. And for me, I'm, I'm a heady person. I like language, I like reading. To me, it was like, reading as much of this stuff as I can, reading Ram Dass, reading Richard Rohr, reading Joseph Campbell, um, reading Rob Bell, and then rereading it. Like it was like a slow, Ram Dass, I don't know if you guys know, he wrote Be Here Now. He has this thing where he, he likens it like he, he's a, the spiritual guy and he's like, it's like he's outside bouncing a ball and we're inside and he's like, going like come out, it's okay come out and play, like where it's, it's spacious and free and let's play. And we're all inside going like, I can't, mother, mother says I have to eat dinner. So there's all these things, but he's not going anywhere. There's no rush, nothing's going anywhere. It's, o it's okay to go at your pace. And one of the things that I'm really happy to share with you guys is like, it's not intense discipline or doing a bevy of things that I hated doing. It was doing a lot of things I love doing finding like great talks that I enjoyed every minute of, where you're listening to something and you stop writing things down because you realize you're writing everything down. I loved it. You listen to an old Ram Dass talk, from, they're on YouTube, or you can buy them on iTunes, or listen to an old Richard Rohr talk if you're leaning more Christian and you want to have language that you can use with your parents. <laughs> it won't work, but you can. Like, I enjoyed it. I think spirituality gets a bad rap that we have to like sit and when I meditate, I mean, my legs are stretched, you know, it's, it's, I'm comfortable. I'm not like, we don't have to be renunciates and like, and, and beat ourselves like Equus to get there. You can do things and find things. Alan Watts, my God, Alan Watts on YouTube, type it in and just <laughs> enjoy it. Enjoy a raspy voice, smoking alcoholic Zen Buddhist from the 60s telling you what you already know, but you forgot. And just be like, ah, and thank the internet for the miracle that it is. But, but allow yourself, it's like a mosaic. Every, every day you're just putting a little tile in and a lot of days you're like, these don't even make sense. But after five, five six, maybe it'll be faster for you. You step back and you go like, oh, there's a, there's a worldview for the mystery that actually feels correct intuitively in my gut. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Hey, uh, Are you Sonic? Yeah, I was gonna say, from one fellow Sonic fan to another, thanks for the Yeah, talk. man. Uh, I found your, I thought your comment about um, if you'd been born in India, you'd be Hindu, it'd be very insightful and resonated with me because that's kind of how I, that insight is kind of how I started to question my religious upbringing. But I wanted to talk about drugs some more. What do you think about... <laughs> <laughs> sonic, Sonic, Sonic. Um, Big Coke guy, Sonic. <laughs> gotta go fast, right? Tails was a weed guy. <laughs> uh, what do you think about the recent decriminalization of psilocybin mushrooms in Denver? I think it's wonderful. I, it makes me, I guess, I'm a bit of a square, so I'm like, oh, please, don't, don't like... Don't give us some headline, you know what I mean, where somebody's gonna go nuts. Because I see what we do with medicinal marijuana. I, I, I've smoked a, a bunch in LA and it's so strong and I'm like, please, like Denver, if you see this, you have this great power and this Spider-Man great responsibility, please give us a good name so we can get this stuff helping people. The first time I took uh, mushrooms, I didn't drink for like, six months without trying. I didn't say I'm gonna stop drinking. The, just the desire had left me because I had been in that place that I wanted to be and I realized it wasn't what alcohol was giving me. So it has this great potential to, to help with alcoholics. It has great potential to help with PTSD, depression and all this stuff. So obviously it's wonderful. I guess the nervous Nelly in me is like, please somebody, some kid don't take like, cause you hear those stories of someone 
that doesn't have the right set and setting, taking LSD, thinking that everybody's an orc, and you know, assaulting somebody, you know, and I'm like, let's 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 not do that. Like that's what happened in the '60s. You know what I mean? Like we we had this unregulated hate Ashbury experience. You know, one person jumps off a building, and and suddenly there's all this like cultural paranoia. I'm like, can we please do this responsibly? and do it in a way that we can start to recognize these things as plant medicines, as sacred medicines. I make a joke in the book where I'm like, it's like we're in Mario Brothers and, and the programmer left mushrooms for us <laughs> as well, and Mario. Mario and us both have the same magic mushrooms to sort of help us, but uh, don't. I, I really hope people don't abuse it. But I'm excited. I mean, uh, ketamine for depression, it's, it's crazy. And, and drug addiction, are you excited? <laughs> Can you tell? I'm gonna ask, <laughs> I found my microdose guy. <laughs> well, did that answer your question? Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. man. I think you were next. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, this is more about crashing and comedy. Sure. How did you choose which bits were like the up and coming Pete that were obviously successful on TV and in your stand-ups to be the like the growth comedian right. on crashing? That's a great question. I, I was doing a, a, a show where I was playing myself just starting in stand-up. And I've been doing stand-up for about 20 years now. So the question, if you don't understand, is like, how did you do, how did you do bad stand-up on purpose, basically? <laughs> and the great thing, this is one of those, it's like every part of the Buffalo sort of things. Like I had all these old notebooks of bad jokes. And I would basically just earnestly do my old material. <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing these jokes and they're about RoboCop or whatever and they're fine. But like, what? It, even if it did get a laugh, because sometimes it'd be like, oh, it's his show, we should laugh. The background actors would laugh because we didn't tell them what to do. And then what Judd would do was he'd just do it again. With no cut, no nothing, I would just do the same joke again. And I don't care how good of a background actor and how nice you are, you're not going to laugh <laughs> at least very well the second time. So like... I was very grateful that like, when I had to slowly start getting better, I would just start slowly doing the material that I did in real time. I would, I, that joke that I did in the finale about my girlfriend making me miss the train was the joke that got me my first half hour special. So I did it and it sort of fit the story because it was the first joke that I did that's personal. But that's what happened in real life. The first time I did like a joke that I actually cared about is when I got my first big TV break and so we recreated that for the show. But then the rest of the time, I just, I was just trying out these bits, and 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 they still don't work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, crispy. You keep it crispy. Thank you. Pete, thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. I really, uh, I've been listening to your podcast for a while, and in a recent one, you were talking about like you saw like, the side of a bus with someone on it, and you were like, you know, there's no reason that can't be me one day. Yeah. Right. And so not like an overconfidence, but just faith in yourself and being confident about what your abilities are. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, uh, and this is kind of like a, I know that you must have struggled for a really long time in your career as well, and kind of curious, uh, kind of a necessary evil uh, and kind of a cringeworthy topic, but how your relationship with just money has changed over time. And and yeah. have you, do you feel like that holds people back um, from pursuing, uh, you know, or being willing to struggle as long as, as maybe other people might? Yeah, it's something, uh, people don't talk about it. I mean, Janine Garofalo has a great joke where she's like, people tell stories about going to LA with $15 in their pocket. What they don't include, this is her joke, is that they had a credit card that went to their parents. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and that, that's true for a lot of us. And I, I can't really misrepresent that I didn't have that support system that a, a lot of us have, but more of us don't have. And it's pretty common, you know, like you see people that, you know, to use a casino term, aren't playing with scared money. Like, they know that if they hit their rock bottom, they can at least move in with their parents. You know what I'm saying? That's not true for everybody. Or, or maybe they'll fall back on some other skills that they, that they have. So when I was starting out, and the, the story you're telling is that I remembered having a moment where I was like, I could never see myself on a bus. And then I, was, I heard the, the voice in my head go, well, you never will be. Um, and then that's when I realized you don't tell anybody, but if you have big dreams, there's, there's no downside to green lighting them for yourself to go like, I'm not going to act like an asshole, but I'm going to quietly, like a little flame inside. You're going to keep that fire going just for you. I believe it. 
I think I deserve it. Then I remember when the first time I was walking around New York and I saw crashing billboards on a bus. It was really fucking surreal. It wasn't like a pride moment. It was like, holy shit, how is this happening? But I don't really know how to talk about money without making myself uncomfortable. I mean, it's interesting, like comedians, when I watch comedians, there's often this assumption, I'm talking about big famous ones, that they're just like everybody, you know, because, because uh, I, I won't name specifics, but there are comedians that I know that talk about, they have airline jokes. And I'm like, you fly private. <laughs> like everyone knows you fly pi private. You were on the Forbes top 10 paid comedians. We know your salary. You're not flying Southwest. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's an interesting thing as an artist is how do you stay even relatable, you know? Um, I, I think there, there are ways to do it, but because so many of us are playing the game of like, can I go to this or can I not? Like, what, what is the job of the artist who, who is doing okay? Am I answering your question? Or was it more about like when you're struggling, how much of, did right, that have I, a factor? I feel like what, were, what was your fallback plan when you were living I, on couches if, you know? That yeah, it, it would have been like move in with my parents or something, I, I suppose, or maybe ask them for money. That, that's, <laughs> that's probably what I would have done. It, it's embarrassing to admit, but we're not gonna get anywhere lying to each other. I, I would have asked for money for rent or whatever. But I, you know, I waited tables and for years at Bennigan's, you can picture it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a motivator, but like there wasn't really a backup plan. But th th this is advice that I've given before. It's like, you have to follow the dream that's also following you, right? So I wasn't just going, I wanna be rich and famous. In fact, every comedian I know that started out to be rich and famous, and there were a lot of them, they, they, they either suck or they quit, they're gone. The comedians that did it because they, they were getting feedback from their psychology, from their surroundings, from their childhoods, that they were supposed to do comedy. You know what I mean? So that's what we were doing. We weren't doing it to get rich and famous. We were doing it because we had to do it. So when you're out there, uh, you need to look, listen for the feedback for your dream. You know what I mean? Because there are going to be moments where you're worried about whether or not you can eat. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Hi. I'm gonna try to keep this short. Um, so uh, you know, you talked about like the analogy where like you're trying to just like you're in a play or like you're in a game. Mm -hmm. um, how do you try to like practice yourself to not get like so deep into it? Because like if you're playing like an actual game, sometimes you're so into it that you think you are the character almost, right? Right. Um, is there something that you kind of like practice or like how do you like keep your mentality in a way that like this isn't really who I am kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I talk about it. There's a chapter in the book called. Um I think it's called Good Episode. And it's this practice of looking at your life depersonally. Obviously you want to, as I used to say in the 60s, you don't want to forget your zip code. <laughs> We're here. Uh, you, I mean, I've heard horrible things that they use mindfulness and some, some of these ideas in like the military and stuff to detach people from their emotions to have them do terrible things. So there are ways to misappropriate these ideas. That's why it's so important to have hey, it's just a game in one hand, and also go, and, and the point is compassion and relieving suffering. I mean, these things need to go together because they're sort of dangerous. They can be weaponized without, without the other. But to me, it's, there's a part in the book where I say, sing happy birthday in your head. We can do it now, it's live. And we don't have to do happy birthday because I'm not doing this on TV. Uh, sing the Rolling Stones satisfaction in your head. Ready, let's all do it. It'll be a happening. When does that happen? <laughs> Everyone in this room is gonna, we're gonna do a one, two, three, four. Yeah. I'm still in the guitar part. <laughs> Some of you jumped right to the lyrics. <laughs> then you just ask, who's hearing that? It's very simple. Who's hearing that? How were you hearing that? It's helpful if you're stoned. <laughs> But seriously, next time you're stoned, think about that. It'll, you'll feel it more. It'll feel more vital. But I do that on stage and I go, why do we have to be stoned for that to be interesting? How are you hearing that? Like, so what is that? And then when you, so the practice is to look at your own life like you're watching TV. That sounds almost psychopathic or sociopathic, but it's to be passionately involved. I know a lot of you are watching Game of Thrones, people are dying, like, ah, but also detached. 
you're not in danger. There's no dragons. You know what I mean? That so you practice that, and, and like the first question, it's slowly you start to feel this extrication from being lost in your small, isolated self. And as Richard Rohr says, once you wake up to this this idea, you'll never be lonely again. You'll see the vital life force in every single thing in equal parts. And that's, that's originally why priests were celibate. It wasn't because sex was bad. It was because they were supposed to be kind of having sex with everything. They were supposed to be so spiritual that everything was almost erotic in, in their communion with every breath of air and every meal. Everything was supposed to be charged with Obviously, we lost the narrative on that one. I don't, wanna, <laughs> I don't even want to go there. It's, it's fucked up. I, I completely agree. But yeah, it, it's, it, the, the answer is the same for both. It's slowly but surely. But if you notice more and more that you're not noticing, that's how you start noticing. Thank you so much yeah. for being here. Everyone, My pleasure. Thank Pete Holmes for being here. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. And go out and buy Comedy Sex God.